I'll be using the term nostalgia frequently, and when doing so, intend to refer to nostalgia, a longing for one's past, an anamoya, a longing for a time one did not live in. I am obsessed with Saturday Night Fever. It is the air in my lungs, the blood in my veins, my ultimate demise if I am without it. I want to own the essence of this film and consume it, be around it, become it. I want to live in 1977 right now, I am discontent with right now. In my performance of the past, am I simply doing the least but expecting the most when carving its perfection, or is there a profound layer underneath this perfect skin? an imperfectly perfect performance. In my longing, what is my responsibility when reviving the couture style of Tony Monero and Stephanie Mangiano? Do I really want to live in an impoverished suburb or work on the chain gang for minimum wage, slaving away 17 and a half hours to buy a hairdryer? Or walk into a club with all but one person being white? Or be around in a time where racism, sexism and gender discrimination were more acceptable and because of this, say something non-politically correct on average every one minute and 24 seconds. What is my political duty whilst playtesting this fantasy? How do I become this character but disown their traits and honour their victims? What is my duty to the nostalgia? It's a scary prospect living in a world where nothing ever changes, but I feel that this is a prospect we are on our way to fulfilling. In our quest to rapidly generate ideas and respond to an exceedingly dynamic environment, the past is a quick fix. But in doing this, is there a political implication of this pastiche that is being overlooked, and a naivety in one believing that this can continue to work and pay off? In reference in the past for a quick fix, are we simply doing the least and expecting the most? Or as some may try to argue, is this simply refinement? But should refinement also acknowledge a problematic past and demonstrate its progression, requesting that you praise its ability to change? On days like these, when skies are blue and fields are green, I look around and think about what might have been. And then I don't do microwaves or dishwashers, I don't go that far, but I do have a fridge, I'm afraid. <laughs> Meat safes aren't great these days. <laughs> I don't think there was a day went by without sort of being beaten up, simple as that. And I once was held down while they jumped on my legs and I was crippled for four months. So there wasn't a day that you went, you went through a nice day where you sort of felt good, you know. Beef O'Brady's theory of semi inflation, where we demand more of an image to purchase meaning over time, taken from The Uprising on Poetry and Finance, MIT Books, 2012. Mark Fisher's notion that intensity resulting from Thatcherism, neoliberalism, and the advancement of mobile telecommunications that has resulted in exhaustion and a withdrawal from cultural production, taken from Mark Fisher, Ghosts of My Life, Zero Books, 2014 and Catherine Niemeyer's theory of wishing to slow down time through wanderlust for the past, fern ve, incurable nostalgia, and curing nostalgia through media absorption, curable nostalgia, heim ve. Catherine Niemeyer, media and nostalgia, yearning for the past, present, and future, Pargrave Macmillan Memory Studies, 2014. It seems that neoliberalism, capitalism, and advancements in telecommunications are the catalyst of our nostalgic longing. 
that collectively create an invariably dynamic environment that almost forces us to submit to upcycling past successes to deliver results rapidly. However, over time, the consumer, not just monetary, but the receiver of the solution concept will become wary of this image of upcycled past, unless, of course, it persists and bombards them, as Berardi's theory of semi-inflation would suggest, to maintain its relevance. And the vehicle to enable this, stemming from Nimeir's notion of Heimweh, curable nostalgia through media absorption. In the film I've just shown, I try to remind ourselves that there are things often forgotten during nostalgic moments such as after dreamily traversing through the Italian Alps during the intro to the Italian job, both driver and Lamborghini Miura crash at the end of a tunnel into a mafia-wielded bulldozer. The austerity and unemployment that plays in the background of old footage from air hangar raves, and the gender discrimination, as told by April Ashley, famous transgender model, dancer and socialite from the 1960s. Furthermore, and as Julie Leeper elegantly puts it in the final scene of my film, Success and timelessness have become a recipe. In her realm, she is the producer, and we are the consumer. She owns the recipe and we all want it. Throughout her video for Future Nostalgia, she bombards us with upcycled images of timeless past successes. From the crystal whiskey glasses, the decanter, the Corbusian interior, and name-dropping John Lautner, to the Burberry trench coat and modernist villa she has stood upon while playing a careless round of golf. This is her recipe for future nostalgia, timelessness, and success. But I feel that this is precisely the issue. In a place that does not progress, yet moves so quickly, and that forgets people so easily as a result, when stood within a performance that is sculpted from pastiche and timeless ideas, how does one stand out? One cannot, unless they are also timeless, or at the very least, different. Because of this, and my personal weariness with the repetitive trends derived from the past, I feel this is a key issue worth investigating, and is why I am attempting to develop a research methodology that can be employed to ensure our duty to nostalgia is not simply naive pastiche, but a complex and informed cultural development. Although Dua Lipa has been made a prime example in my explanation so far, the most consistent perpetrator committing consistent crimes against nostalgia on an enormous scale is Gucci whose spring-summer campaign from 2016 features at the start of my film. They consistently fabricate fantasy around the past and play-test this through youthful dreamers that feed off of consumers' wanderlust for nostalgia. Because of this, the 1970s became my decade of concern that I wanted to scrutinise. Saturday Night Fever was recognised in 2010 by the Library of Congress for Preservation and the National Film Registry in America and the aim of this institution is to preserve films with artistic, cultural or historical significance. Because of this, it felt like a perfect subject to put under scrutiny. I purchased a 1998 UK release VHS copy of the film, and on the back, the plot states, John Travolta gives a central and intelligent performance as a local disco kingpin at the peak of his popularity. Once a week, after six full days of work in a Brooklyn paint store, Tony Travolta douses himself with brute cologne, dons a floral body shirt, gabardine pants and platform shoes and ritualistically prepares himself for Saturday Night Fever. Through the influence of Stephanie, his more sophisticated dance partner, and Tony's brother, a disillusioned priest, Tony begins to question the way he views life and the narrowness of his perspective. The disco dance sequences and the Bee Gees music make the film an accurate and absorbing barometer for the 70s generation. This demonstrates how an ideology of the past and nostalgia are sold, paying little attention to the political narratives around gender, race, sexuality and religion but further emphasising the fantastical dance scenes and brilliant soundtrack above all, and claiming to be an accurate and absorbing barometer for the 70s generation despite this. Initial observations of tribal rights for the new Saturday Night, the article written by Nick Cohn for the New York Times that Saturday Night Fever is based on, comes loaded with harsh reality around the film and time that we are quickly made aware of thanks to the author's arrogance. A few unforgettable quotes from the article include, he must also be fluent in obscenity, offhand in sex. Italians were Italian, Latins were greaseballs, Jews were different, and blacks were born to lose. Then there were girls, but they were not faces, not truly. Sometimes if a girl got lucky, a face might choose her from the crowd and raise her to be his steady, whom he might one day even marry, but that was rare. In general, the female function was to simply be available, to decorate the doorways and booths, to fill up the dance floor. 
speak when spoken to, put out as required, and then go away. In short, to obey and not fuss. One could disregard the film and their nostalgia based on this. However, our duty, knowing this now, is to make others aware of this and prevent further delusion. My initial response was to go through the film and document every controversial action and piece of dialogue that takes place. The result is a mini-zine called Every Time I Wasn't PC, Saturday Night Fever. This became an 84-page document and a concise overview of the film and the series problems, summarised physically. It captured moments such as a customer in Tony's paint shop criticising his wife for having stretch marks, corporal punishment by Tony's parents, harassment of a gay couple by Tony's friends, and Tony, a white Italian-American, using racial slurs. By this point, one could say that they had met the film at face value, but I felt we could still go deeper from this, and two methods of approach developed. One, episodic scrutiny, and two, the performance. Episodic scrutiny began with pulling together a research document. The document includes my own script of a 118-minute film, furthering my intimate knowledge of the storyline and its intricacies, before being punctuated with questions that became key political topics that I wanted to forensically analyse. These include film locations then and now, that involved virtually exploring film locations with Google Street View to identify economic, cultural and political shifts in Bay Ridge. Tony's posters, exploring the themes of films, music and TV shows his posters depict to learn more about him and 1977 America, which helped with the development and understanding of this character so I could develop my own. Tony's hairdryer, utilising eBay, online Argos catalogue archives and historic exchange rates from the Bank of England to develop an obsessive inquiry into Tony's hairdryer that uncovers its original specs, marketing, costs, and, and comparison to other models at the time that allowed me to assess its political impact on Tony. Economics of Tony, a rational approximation of how much Tony earns based on historic minimum wage statistics from the US Department of Labor, and using these to forecast Tony's wages, how much he spends going out, how much he works, and also how much the hairdryer discussed in the previous article would have cost. Saturday Night Fever, the 1970s problem with race. This involved a simple frame hold and head count approach to identifying the very heavily weighted imbalance of Odyssey 2001 that addresses the fact that there is only one black person in the club and proceeds to speculate their presence and disappearance in reference to Nick Cohn's article. Finally, Roman Catholicism, an exploration of how this institution politically binds all of the protagonists and how their laws against abortion affect the discourse of their lives as a result. This is contrasted by modern institutional beliefs to draw attention to how definitely archaic and potentially criminal the Roman Catholic Church is and how they favour men over women. These inquiries created a distance between myself and the reality I thought I knew of this film, stepping into a space of criticality that allowed me to better understand the programming of the time I longed for. These inquiries created a distance between myself and the reality I thought I knew of this film, stepping into a space of criticality that allowed me to better understand the programming of this time that I longed for. From this, I was able to contrast this with our current socio-cultural political climate and assess the impact that reviving this ideological past would have. Rather than distribute the faux nostalgic fantasy I'd developed previously, this produced something that could be shared to create discussion around my nostalgia and address the problematic intricacies that lie beneath an aesthetic past. Initially, this was simply to share my films publicly on platforms such as YouTube and consider creating a website for this series. However, I wanted to engage with a specific audience. So I distributed the film to Julie Tom Carson, chief operations organizer of Warner Records, Julie's record label, Ben Mawson, Julie's manager, and Alessandro Michel, creative director of Gucci. And lastly, the people who are nostalgic for this film like I am, which involved distributing my series and this Viva online as a watch free online version of Saturday Night Fever. The second approach to exploring our duty to nostalgia was to develop a character and performance that would become a more physical engagement with my nostalgia in the film. The aim of this was to become Tony and play test the The aim of this was to become Tony and play test his reality, which was achieved through two outcomes. The first was to create a costume that would allow me to become a Tony like character through creating an outfit to perform in. The second process was to learn some moves and channel my new understanding of Tony's character into imperfect performances that imitated the film. Both of these processes were very challenging for me, 
I have a very limited knowledge of sewing and tailoring, so obtaining a high quality outcome was going to be difficult. Furthermore, the performances involved taking a massive step outside my comfort zone and overcoming my greatest anxieties around expressing myself so openly. However, I firstly want to discuss the costume. This consisted of a red polyester body shirt and gabardine flares, and there were several issues that I had to overcome almost immediately. Firstly, most of the materials and hardware took up to 10 days to arrive due to changes within postal services that were responding to COVID-19. This unfortunately staggered the process of making. The second issue to overcome was I've never sewn garments and the vintage simplicity patterns I bought were not my size, with the shirt being a 42 inch chest and the trousers being a 38 inch waist, which I needed to make fit a 36 inch chest and a 30 inch waist. This process was rigorous and time consuming, but worth it, initially involving taking two inches off all the seams on both trousers and shirt before pinning and tacking. This resulted in a rough fit, but we're still some way off perfect. So the process continued, pin, tack, test, and then sew once I was satisfied. The fit was refined with darts in the back of the shirt and above the waist and the trousers to accentuate curves and nip in all the right places. Overall, I was satisfied with the results, but next time I would use a fabric with more elastine for the trousers as I did tear through the butt sitting down. Great fit, but not great for sitting down, just dancing, walking and standing. I would also remember to put the sleeves on the right way around so cuff openings face the right way on the shirt. <sighs> Unfortunately, due to lockdown, I was unable to go out and meet people who might be able to help with my dancing problems. But fortunately, my partner used to dance Latin and ballroom to a very high standard and also studied at Patterson's Performing Art College in Coventry. So she offered to help me. We arranged FaceTime dance lessons where she taught me a simplified routine taken from Saturday Night Fever as this process developed, my confidence grew, and this became something I wanted to explore and take further despite my anxieties. Four performances developed, including my own version of the intro to Saturday Night Fever, imitating Tony's carnivorous eating habits and saying one of my favourite lines from the film, a dance sequence, and finally, a performance involving forensically recreating Tony's bedroom within my own. The bedroom performance was perhaps my most profound engagement with the film. Within this performance, for the first time, I found myself stood within a fictitious space that I derived from the film simply using semiotics to code specific interactions, which allowed me to replicate someone else's life through a performance, and to some extent, now living part of my nostalgia. I would like to have explored this methodology of programming space for specific interactions further, perhaps by coding space to influence other people's engagements with my nostalgia through provoking unintentional performances. My duty towards nostalgia has been mistaken as an aesthetic revival in search of good ideas, resulting in a weary disservice. In becoming intimately engrossed in Saturday Night Fever and going through hell and back in terms of my relationship with it, I feel that our duty to nostalgia is partly and simply to develop a healthy relationship with time. In obsessing over an aesthetic past, there are deluding preconceptions that can be addressed through uncovering what lays beneath. In my case, this was a lot of racism, gender discrimination and sexism. In discovering this reality, however, we can develop distance between ourselves and our longing that can become a vantage point for criticality and progression. I would not say that criticality is the means by which to take action, but is certainly important to develop detachment when moving on to performing and to develop critical thinking in the present. In developing detachment, I felt that my commitment to perfection was relieved no longer chasing a dream, but instead looking forward to how I can... Re in developing detachment, I felt that my commitment to perfection was relieved, no longer chasing a dream, but instead looking forward to how I can create an alternative way of engaging with the thing it would now seem that I love. In doing this, I felt I could simplify how I programmed my surroundings to become what I wanted them to be, and sometimes created contradictions, the biggest of all being when I dubbed my garden shed Odyssey 2001. In a way, our duty is to break down our ideal of a refined or perfect performance of the past and instead explore how it can be recoded and adapt to our environment and or limitations, which may as a result become playful spaces to further cultural development and exploration. The performances in their most basic application may lend themselves well to how we market nostalgia and develop a process of ideation. However, I feel that in critically approaching nostalgia, it has made me evaluate the institution's duty towards this in terms of ensuring honesty and critical thinking, 
rather than placing past successes on a pedestal and eternally maintaining that it is successful. Preservation is perhaps not ensuring success, but developing provocative conversations around emergent failure and sharing this with a wider audience to provoke discussions and evoke new ideas through critical thinking.